Thank you so much, Mr. Case, for talking to Mitra and welcome to Vision. Um, recently, Afghanistan was announced uh, as the third most corrupt country in the world. Where does UNDP and in general UN stand in this regard? Well, what's very clear is this government has um, de demonstrated a newfound commitment to rooting out corruption. So for UNDP, which has been in this country for many, many years, uh, almost five decades now, it's a refreshing uh, uh, optic and it's refreshing, uh, it's a breath of fresh air, I should say, um, on how this government wants to tackle this. Of course, the roots of corruption go very deep and uh, it's been around for a long time. So it will take time, it will take commitment. Um, but I do understand that uh, this current uh, administration, together with the international community, has uh, set very clear goals um, on how to um, minimize this, uh, this problem, which is a problem not only to uh, the present, but also to future generations. Mm -hmm. And UNDP, we know that uh, UNDP is involved in lots of big programs in Afghanistan. And to fight uh, the corruption in the country, what are you guys taking actions, you know, in what regards are you guys taking action to help Afghanistan fight corruption? Well, what we do is um, we primarily act as a channel of technical assistance and financial assistance from the international community, from uh, donor countries who want to help the country and people of Afghanistan to apply and to administer and to oversee the use of those funds. So transparent use of uh, funding is crucial to everything that we do. And therefore, um, as part of the um, compact with both the government of Afghanistan and those governments who entrust to us those funds, uh, we must ensure that we have a certain degree, a high degree of financial oversight on how each dollar, yen, or euro is used in this country. So over the years, um, there have been challenges, um, but we've uh, worked very closely. For example, the Ministry of Interior, we're working very closely to ensure all of the money that comes in to support the payroll of the national police is, uh, is being used for its intended purpose. Mm -hmm. And for our audience to have a clear, actually, uh, idea of what you guys are doing, could we just, could you uh, talk very briefly about what UNDP is doing in Afghanistan? Well, we are the UN Development Program. So the question is, what is development? And that's a more difficult question than is often rec recognized. Development is all about increasing the choices that people, you, me, have in life. To, you know, we were all put on this world to do something. And each life is a journey to find out what that thing is that we were meant to do. How do we realize our full potential? So the more choices that people have, minimizing those barriers for women, gender uh, equality is very important because in many cases, women are prevented from having the right choices th that they were meant to have. Poverty, another huge obstacle to, again, becoming what we were meant to become. So therefore, that's the defining uh, purpose of UNDP, to help people expand the choices. So we do that primarily through supporting governments and developing policies and programs to help their people. Here in Afghanistan, um, one of the major projects that we've had over the last decade has been a major project to support the national police. And that has been primarily to um, uh, support the international community and the government of Afghanistan to ensure that police are paid. But that also involves uh, capacity building, um, uh, support to help the police to conduct themselves according to human rights um, uh, and uh, uh, principles. We also have many other programs. For the example, the last few elections, UNDP supported the operational, the, the ballot boxes, the ballots, getting them printed. Where do they go? Uh, we've supported uh, the last three elections, and we uh, hope to, uh, to be involved in the next ones as well. They do take place in October of this year. Uh, another big project has been uh, our, our project on gender. Again, supporting women to, um, to have the full rights that they were meant to have in this world. So we have, the challenge with UNDP is we have many different areas. Health, local governance, gender, environment, livelihoods, and rule of law. Six major areas. 
and I could go on and on for our projects in each, but that would, uh, that would bore your, your audience. Mm -hmm. I need to get back again. I need to refer to the uh, corruption phenomenon because that's sucking you know, the blood of Afghanistan. And you are referring to your programs for funding the police in Afghanistan. Uh, a, a recent, not a very recent, but an article published in Wall Street Journal shows that uh, there was a piece about the UNDP uh, the, uh, involvement in Afghanistan. And it referred to a program called Trust Fund, where they um, uh, su uh, suspected that there might be money in business in this program and we know we understand that the uh, report the piece was never out for the public but uh, what did uh, 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 UNDP really do in that regard did they really evaluate the program did they find the kind of corruption because that is something the Afghan government is fighting as well it is it, it is doing its best to fight these problems um, you know any international agency any donor uh, who is going to be carrying out significant volume of work here, financial volume, has to anticipate and understand that there are major issues of corruption. The president himself has gone on record and made it very clear that it's a problem um, down to the ministry level. So anyone who comes in here and thinks, uh, you know, we're going to get things done like we would get done in uh, Norway or New Zealand is fooling themselves. Um, my priority is to ensure that the overall strategic objectives of what we do in this country are the police getting paid? Mm -hmm. Are the elections taking place mm -hmm. in a credible fashion? Mm -hmm. Are our projects reaching those women in that micro-enterprise to help improve their lives? Mm -hmm. If those broader strategic objectives are fulfilled and met, that's good. That's a step forward. Mm -hmm. And all the while, as we carry it with each passing year, we need to do our best to make sure that those problems of corruption, the misuse of funds, is going down and further, further down, and, and they have been. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, there were controversial, uh, you know, incidents, what happened to the elections, and of course, later on, you know, again to the police, that is still, uh, at, even the Afghan media, sometimes they touch, you know, on that topic, and they say that the police... I don't know. I mean, it might not be at the very high levels, but at the lower levels, you know, that you're dealing with the Afghan government, but the salaries that they are paid, you know, sometimes it gets embezzled on the way. So how do you guys evaluate that? Do you think that something like that exists or, or you guys have well, been able to tackle it? Yeah, well, what we do is um, we've been strengthening the role of what we call the monitoring agent. And this is um, uh, an auditing firm that uh, has, uh, whose role and involvement in this police project over the last few years has significantly increased in terms of its involvement and direct oversight going out to the provinces, going out to the police stations, asking policemen, did you get your salary? Who are the policemen on this list who are supposed to be getting their salaries? Everyone raised their hand. Are they all here? That role has been significantly strengthened at the request of the Ministry of Interior and the President himself. And so therefore, again, step by step, as we go from year to year, we are seeing a demonstrable improvement and a readiness of the government itself to address these problems. And that's, again, a very refreshing step forward. And do you see a readiness of the government from UN N NUJ for fighting the corruption and helping you guys you know, in the individual programs? From my point of view, in terms of, for example, when we see that there have been a number of ineligible expenses, that's what we call them, for the police payroll, we report those to the Ministry of Interior, and they have to come up with the funds to compensate for the, for the, spe the funds that were spent incorrectly. And they have been doing that consistently since I've been here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there were, there were some speculations and rumors as well about ghost policemen being paid you know, and being you know, on the payrolls. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, do you guys have reports on that? Or? Well, again, I think in a country um, at the level of development of Afghanistan, it's very difficult to keep day-to-day, real-time information on who has died, who has left, who has moved from province to province. Um, in a perfect world, uh, in, uh, in, in much of the West, that real-time information exists. Mm -hmm. But we cannot take it for granted that it exists here. There are going to be lulled time lags. Mm -hmm. And again, the question is, how do we minimize those time lags to make sure that the payments are going to who they're supposed to be going to? And Mr. Kalitz touch, you know, about your future programs. You know, Afghanistan, it has the highest number of young people. Almost 60 to 65% of the population is under the age of 25. 
what are you guys really planning to help the Afghan uh, young generation? You might um, have heard about the brain drain and the immigration, the illeg illegal immigration of Afghan youth to Europe these days. So what are you guys specifically doing to stop it? Well, again, I think the fact that 400,000 people are coming into the job market here in Afghanistan every year is a major concern. And that touches on much more complex issues such as the security situation, the absence of jobs, the difficulty of the private sector and the lack of investment, again, due to insecurity. So again, in my opinion, and I think common knowledge is security is the linchpin for all of this to work. That said, in the short term, we as UNDP are, you know, we're working with the government to develop jobs programs that specifically focus on that target that you mentioned earlier. Uh, educated, semi-educated, um, uh, middle, lower, middle, lower, upper class uh, people with some degree of education, maybe some high school, college education. Um, those are the ones that we're seeing leaving very often. And again, um, our approach is rather than coming up with ideas in our heads, what do these people want to do with their lives? What will keep them here in Afghanistan? We need to talk with them. There needs to be a dialogue with these people. The, and rather than imposing on them, we think this is what you should be doing for the rest of your life. And they you, need to be involved in that. And you call security a mass for this. Do you see that kind of security now, or you think it's quite fragile? Well, obviously, um, with the current efforts underway by the government um, to address this issue, um, uh, that's, that's encouraging. Will it happen overnight? I think there are few, very few people that uh, expect uh, the situation to change overnight. Mm. So, um, but again, I don't think the situation, certainly in terms of jobs creation and uh, incentives for people to stay here and um, uh, contribute to the economy here, I don't think without security that's going to happen anytime soon. Mm. And Mr. K, you know, what, one of your achievements, the UNDP's achievement, has been working in regards with justice and uh, uh, human rights and gender equality programs in the country. But the kind of, with the rising violence in the country, you might have heard you know, about the girl whose nose was, for example, cut only a few days ago that we are talking now. And of course, you know, what happened to Farhonda and these guys. Do you really think that your programs have been quite realistic? in a country like Afghanistan, in a very traditional society like this country, and while you know, there is still a very you know, huge gap between you know, uh, 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 realism and what we, of course, implement the program. So how do you see that? Well, I think there's various ways an organization like UNDP can make a difference. One is through direct financial program support. We have programs to help women entrepreneurs start a business together. They provide some of their savings. We provide some of the technical assistance on how to uh, 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 dry fruits, to sell, to how to jar fruits, how to sell these in the market for a profit. That's the type of technical assistance that we can bring. But again, those types of interventions, you can only reach a certain number of, of, of women in this case to empower them, to take charge of their lives. It's something that's very important to us. But again, the type of financial assistance, it's expensive. Another way to support people um, in this regard, in terms of, for example, advocating for women's rights, is precisely to be the voice of the international community. What has worked in other parts of the world? What are some of the standards and roles played by women in other parts of the world, and how has that benefited other societies? We need to introduce those perspectives. You know, let's not forget that not too long ago, um, there was gender equality here in Afghanistan. And it's really been, what, the past 25, 30 years where the tearing of the social fabric has resulted in a very clear e disequilibrium, an imbalance. And again, so in my opinion, it's really equally as much as reaching the people directly through UNDP or UN or government intervention mm -hmm. as it is to advocate mm -hmm. and remind people of why it's important to give 50% of your population the right to realize their full potential, the right to contribute to the welfare of their economy, their families, and their communities. And Mr. K, but as an advocate organization for human rights and gender equality, are you concerned about the field trials which is happening in the country? The field trials? trials like women being executed. 
like you know, their noses being cats. So again, for me, this demonstrates two things. One, over years, there's been a certain devaluing of life that needs to be returned. Basic rights and liberties and, and protections for people. Second, the rule of law is important. That means rule law, sorry, that means law's rule. The, the predominance, the preeminence of laws. It's not like what you want to do and how you want to take out your anger against your wife or a woman in town or what I want to do against someone who I feel has wronged me. There need to be rules to which people are held accountable. There needs to be penalty when people break those rules. And therefore, when you're mentioning this case of a woman being having her nose cut off or public executions, that is also a sign of the continuing need for rule of law. And that means government institutions that can adjudicate and provide a source of justice, access to justice. People need to feel that they, if something goes wrong, they will get justice. I'm not so sure that the family of my staff member feels that way today. And uh, let's be just a bit optimistic about the future of the country. Uh, we know that the people of Afghanistan are a bit concerned about the uh, foreign troops withdrawal from the country. But on the other hand, the uh, UN's uh, sustainable develop development goal, it has been extended again for another 15 years. So we will have it, you know, for until uh, 2030. What uh, specific programs would you have for Afghanistan, would N UNDP have for Afghanistan? Well, I think the, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, and thank you for bringing this up, because what this is, is an agenda which, which uh, can, takes place just now for the next 15 years, which follows the Millennium Development Goals for the past 15 years. And though the, the MDGs were very successful because it brought down global poverty, uh, gender uh, uh, discrimination, um, infant mortality, it was a hugely successful campaign. As we look forward, the goals have now reached a total of 17, but fundamentally, it's the similar agenda of bringing a better life to the people of this world and to the people of Afghanistan. And is it doable for Afghanistan? I think with peace and with continued uh, uh, cooperation with the international community, uh, it is possible. Uh, in terms of reducing poverty further, in terms of protecting the environment, in terms of strengthening government institutions to play their role in bringing a better life to the people of Afghanistan, it's possible. However, we also have to recognize that looking forward, as you mentioned, international forces are already starting to pull out. I'm more focused on the reduction in development aid coming to this country. And in my view, it's really the next three, maximum four years, where there will be a continued significantly high level of aid to this country. But that's it. I really do believe these next three, four years, it's crucial that we move away from this dependence that's been created over decades of heavy amounts of aid coming to this country and do everything we can in terms of UNDP, the UN system, but mostly the, the government of Afghanistan, which wants to be independent, needs to know and learn and to be capacitated to have the capacity to do these things on its own. But it might take quite a very long time because the government of Afghanistan is, is not self-sufficient and they are still relying on the aid coming from, you know, an influx, a big influx of you know, aid coming from foreign countries. But should people be expecting a reduction in UNDP and in general UN's aid as well to Afghanistan in the coming years to come? Well, I think what they can and should expect is a change in how we partner with this government. And that our role as the international community needs to shift from providing aid and finance to building the capacity, helping this government to lead the process of development. And that hasn't been happening over the last 15 years. That's what I meant earlier. This, this, this almost relationship of dependence has been taken for granted. And that's what happens sometimes when there's huge amounts of aid and very little accountability. As we move forward the next three, four years, all of us, certainly the international community, in partnership with the government, and I know the government wants this, need to start focusing on how to help the government 
do these things on its own, how to govern on its own, how to provide a better life for its people on its own. But Mr. Sakay with the newest statistics showing Afghanistan the third most corrupt country in the world, and there is no accountability of the government in the country, there is people are losing their trust, you know, as you might have seen, you know, these recent statistics. Why would, what, what would be the answer of UN and UNDP to the people of Afghanistan that they think that the government has now the capability of you know, governing the country while still we have lots of problems in the country? You know, the development programs are not being implemented properly because of security, as you pointed out. Women, you know, rights. We know that, you know, women, they have kind of approached a kind of a level of, you know, development, but it's still, you know, the violence is rising day by day because of insecurity. So why would, what, what would be the answer of UN, you know, in, 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 in reducing their aid to the country? Well, again, um, I don't think it would be accurate to say there's no accountability in this country. I think there are leading lights. There are champions of greater accountability. There are champions in this country, in this government. Your program, for example, can be one to get the word out. In my opinion, the trigger in this change of attitude, because at the end of the day, it's not technical. It's a change in attitude in how this country needs to be run, how communities need to live with each other. And in my opinion, over the last 15 years, again, there's been so much money coming to this country that, uh, and not enough focus on the results that with this next final window, I'm hoping that the government, the people of Afghanistan, and the international community will come together and start to realize this is it. We really need to start doing what we should have been doing many years ago and building capacity and helping the people of Afghanistan have a better life. Well, one thing that the people of Afghanistan touch on is that a big influx of money which came to Afghanistan went back to the foreign countries by the foreign expats. Do you agree with that? Like the Cigar, for example, reports, it shows that lo huge amount of money, an influx of money, came to Afghanistan. But again, you know, lots of it was channeled back to foreign countries by the expats. Well, I think um, it's important that people understand how, how this relationship works. Whenever an agency like UNDP or any other donor uh, or international aid provider comes to the country, it's uh, rarely the case that they will use every single dollar, yen or euro only in that domestic economy. For example, we, we need to, our role is to bring in perspectives from other parts of the world. What has worked? And that's called technical assistance. The best practices, the lessons learned. How did, how did Kenya reduce uh, a poverty in that country? How did Peru reduce the infant mortality rate? And therefore, that type of technical assistance costs money. You need to bring in international experts with that perspective. And that often costs money. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge moving ahead is it's, it's gone a little bit away from that model towards one of paying salaries for this government. And that's something that you know, the, gov the president himself has said, it needs to stop. That's not an effective use of international aid paying salaries. Mm -hmm. And so gradually with all of our projects as we're moving forward, we're reducing that component of our projects and trying to focus much more on the ideas and the best practices and the lessons learned on all the areas that I've been talking to you about today. Mm -hmm. Gender, livelihoods, environment. Mm -hmm. Environment is, is the challenge of the future. And countries like, like Afghanistan will be the first ones to suffer greater natural disasters, mm -hmm. drought, floods, landslides. It's already happening, but with the continuation of climate change in about 15, 20 years, all of this conflict business will seem like, like child's play compared to the big natural disasters that will be affected. And what is uh, your organization doing in that regard? Well, we're uh, trying to mobilize funds right now with the Global uh, uh, Environment Facility. Um, the Global Climate Fund. These are new financial uh, uh, mechanisms in the international community mm -hmm. which result from the recent Paris conference, the, the, the community of, of practice, the COP21, which identified a significant um, amount of financing w which will now be made available for countries like Afghanistan. So our focus here is we have several projects that are focused on uh, helping Afghanistan adapt, mm -hmm. adaptation, to the threat of climate, uh, to the, to the um, impacts of climate change, 
again, disaster risk reduction. We'll be working very closely with Anmar and the minister there, uh, Vice Barmac, uh, to, uh, to help the country prepare and minimize uh, 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 the, their exposure to uh, natural uh, disasters and climate change. One of the things that people are quite interested to know is, like, what are your mechanisms and, uh, for like, finding out the needs of the people? How do you find out like, what people, for example, in Bamiyan need, or what people in Balf, for example, need, or in Kabul? What are the social tools that you guys have? Do you like, go and you know, see the social media, or do you just talk and, and launch surveys? Well, again, um, I think dialogue with, uh, well, l to answer your question in one word, it's about partnership. Mm -hmm. UNDP doesn't do anything on its own. Mm -hmm. What we think is right for this country, that doesn't happen. We identify programs through partnership, communication with the national authorities, uh, the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, uh, the Ministry of Labor, we also work very closely with local government, the provincial governor's office in Herat, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the provincial governor's office in Balkh as well. Uh, I was there uh, uh, l last year, um, as well as community leaders. Mm -hmm. And so when I go out to these provinces, to these communities, um, I always take the advantage to, uh, uh, to uh, take the opportunity to meet with people, hear from them, what are, what are their needs? What do they feel is necessary? Mm -hmm. I, I like to avoid, to the extent possible, a one-sided dialogue. It needs to be a two-way two, two street of what the people and country need and what the United Nations system can offer. And it's that two-way street that I always believe is the most effective solution to long-term development. Mm -hmm. And what is the size of the UN's and especially the UNDP's aid for Afghanistan in 2016? And what projects will you be mainly focused on this year? Well, currently we're the largest UN agency in Afghanistan. And in fact, the UNDP office in Afghanistan is by far the biggest UNDP office in the world. We have an annual delivery um, which, uh, in which we mobilize funding from donor governments like um, Japan, European Union, uh, Korea, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, so currently we have a uh, annual delivery of 2016 of about 650 million dollars, mm -hmm. which for again for the UN presence here in Afghanistan, it's by far the largest, and for us worldwide, it's the biggest. In terms of your question of what are the major components, this year will be the final year when we are channeling funding to the national police salary. Mm -hmm. As of by the end of this year, we will transfer all of those abilities to manage the funds to to ensure that precise technical use of to make sure that the, the number of soldiers is matched with the financing. We're currently doing that very closely with the Ministry of Interior. But by the end of this year, our hope is that the Ministry of Interior will be able to do this independently. Mm -hmm. And the funds will go, we will continue to manage the funds in a way, but most of that will be going directly to the Ministry. Mm -hmm. So we will lose that project. Uh, but will you I oversee the, the accountability and the transpa uh, transparency of Yes, that? we will continue to be the trust fund manager, mm -hmm. but we won't be working with Ministry of Interior officials to make sure that every step of the transition, the, the, the channel from donor to central bank to Ministry of Finance to Ministry of Interior to the provinces out there, we won't be directly involved because hopefully by then we will have helped the ministry to do this on its own. So again, uh, the police project is a big one, um, but we have others uh, helping rural communities have access to energy. Because many of these communities, they're burning things in their small homes, and it's terrible for their health. They're bringing, breathing in huge amounts of carbon dioxide and smoke, which is, reduces their lifespan. We are providing them with uh, solar power, uh, wind power, hydropower, which will hopefully change their lives. So access to energy is another big one. We have gender projects. We have a big migration project aimed at helping the, um, again, those potential migrants, those people who are most likely to leave, to stay in the country with jobs. And again, our first step, which we will hopefully be launching in the next couple of months, will be establishing a dialogue with communities um, to see what these people want to do with their lives. And based on that, we can develop jobs programs. Mm -hmm. and Okay, what is one single legacy that UNDP might ever have in Afghanistan? What would it be like for, for, the, for, for Afghanistan, for the people? Well, we're told that, um, that one of the most uh, um, long-lasting legacies was 
was established long before I arrived here, and that was supporting today, today's Ministry of um, Rural Rehabilitation and Development to, to get running. And this was about 10 years ago where UNDP had a key role in supporting that ministry in terms of de developing policies on rural rehabilitation and development, developing the, the, the approach to bringing in good people, uh, developing the approach to using donor funds for good programs, precisely your question before, helping the ministry understand and develop best practice in terms of hearing from the people of Afghanistan in the rural areas what they needed. And those have all lasted until today, making MRRD one of the strongest ministries in the government. Um, we're working very closely with them, but now at the project level. But what we're very proud of is that, you know, 10 years ago, we helped them to, to govern better. And that is one of UNDP's primary goals, not to do things ourselves, but to help authorities, local authorities, national authorities, to, to help bring a better life to their own people. So we, sh we should rarely, if ever, take the front row seat in all of this. We need to take a very back row seat with the authorities in the lead. And what's your vision for the future of the country? Well, my vision of the future of the country and our relationship is one where we are supporting much more policy level. What I, what I mentioned to you before, less, less providing money for salaries and more for ideas and technical assistance with that little drop of knowledge to help it go a much longer way in this country. And my vision for, that, for the country is, um, a, a, well, ideally it's a peaceful country where there's investment in this country, private sector growth, with a government which is supporting the rule of law and providing, providing protection for its people, for its women, um, allowing a, a place where the women can go when they have political, or sorry, legal problems, where they know their cases will be addressed fairly and t in a timely manner. Um, uh, and where UNDP's support then is quite minor. It's, it's, again, the ideas that can feed into a system that can very quickly and effectively operationalize those ideas from other parts of the world to help the people here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for taking part in Vision. Thank you. Thank you.